view, does that look like a scene from the Teletubbies? I don't know. Maybe you guys never watched the Teletubbies. It's, it's like a show for little kids. All right. Yeah, mo yeah. Wrong audience for this joke, I think. Yeah. It, it, it's funny because, you know, you can almost tell how old a kid uh, or uh, a parent's kids are based on, like, what kid shows they know. You know, the tele my kids are kind of from the Teletubby era, so that instantly reminds me of that. All right. Here's what we're going to do today. We're going to do a little recapping of last time. Uh, we're going to fill in a couple of holes of stuff that I wish I would have mentioned, but I forgot to. All right. And then we're going to start um, defining a little more precisely some of the things that we sort of talked about, but maybe didn't define in, in very precise terms. First thing we, uh, uh, one thing that we spent a good amount of time on, and I think is important to always remember, um, are the advantages of using relational databases compared to other ways. And for our purposes, we can think of the other ways of storing data as being like spreadsheets. They're not they're not necessarily spreadsheets, but they're similar. You know, a table, rows and columns, everything sort of combined together into one. The way the textbook would say is multiple themes in one big giant table. And we talked about the advantages of uh, uh, eliminating redundancy. We talked about the advantages of referential integrity. We talked about the fact that in um, the sequential files, <coughs> in the non-database approach, uh, we had uh, several uh, anomalies that could happen. You could have inconsistency if you didn't update everything. Um, you could have uh, a delete anomaly where deleting a section might get rid of all the information about a professor in the, in the whole table. And we talked about an insert anomaly. What if we were trying to insert a professor and we didn't have a class form? That would kind of be confusing uh, and could be, be potential misleading. Another advantage that we really didn't mention is it really, uh, relational databases sort of facilitate uh, sharing of data. All right. We kind of alluded to that because one of the things that we said is that the greater the flexibility that you have to combine data in multiple ways, the, the more uh, information you're going to get out of it and the better information you're going to have. And put another way, if you can get that information in the right hands, if you can share that information in the right hands, you're better off as well. Um, Dell computers, if you, if you order a computer from Dell, um, and let's say you order and you want a certain size disk drive on your laptop. You want a, you know, a, I don't know, 250 gigabyte hard drive on your laptop. Well, if they're out of them in inventory, the, the phone operator or the website will say, look, we got a special on a 400 gigabyte hard drive or something like that. All right. The idea is, is that that data is shared between their sales end and their inventory end. And that way they can offer you a deal as opposed to saying, well, look, you know, we're going to have to back order that. Well, if you're going to back order it, you'll probably get frustrated and go to another vendor. All right. But they're able to share inventory information that's appropriate with um, the sales folk and the sales end of the business. And that allows for some good things to happen. That's sort of a different flavor of flexibility in combining, you know, getting data, being able to share across more people. The disadvantage of relational databases are small, all right? Um, they take up a lot of space. They're a little more complicated to put together. Um, probably a little costlier. Um, uh, when you run uh, a database, typically you run a big program called a database management system. And we'll talk more about this program and, and what it does for you um, in future classes. Suffice it to say that the database management system is sort of the gatekeeper to the database. No matter what program needs to access the database, it does it through the database management system. So I could write a, a web page that needs to access the database. You could write a desktop application that needs to access the database and so on. Regardless of that, it goes through the DBMS. 
And that's nice because things such as constraints, you only have to implement in the database and every application will obey those constraints. You know, I, I talked a little bit last time about referential integrity and making sure, for example, that a customer has a valid order associated, or I'm sorry, other way around. An order has a valid customer associated with it. Well, if you used file systems, whereas every program accessed the file completely on their own, then the chain's only as strong as the weakest link, all right? Your data is only going to be as good as your worst programmer, all right? Because if that person makes a mistake, they could uh, uh, damage the integrity of the database. In this case, if you build the constraints in the, in the, the DBMS, every program that tries to access that data is going to be subject to those constraints. Um, and that's a good thing. It's a good thing because um, you're not at the mercy of your, of your worst programmer. If the database is defined correctly then, even if they make a mistake in the programming, the database won't allow, for example, an order to go through that doesn't have a valid customer or whatever. However, the DBMS is expensive. You know, typically it's, it's a more expensive piece of software. Um, it requires space. Uh, the data itself requires space because in addition to the data, we store what's called metadata or data about the data, data about the relationships. And so even though we get rid of redundant data, we still end up taking up more physical disk space with a relational database. That being said, again, these disadvantages are small compared to the advantages. So it would be a very rare instance where you'd say, no, I don't want to use a database for a new application you're building. Yes? Right. Data yeah, data about data. I'm kind of confused when you said uh, redundant data as well. How, how come metadata doesn't? Um, well, let, let me get, let's give an example of, of uh, some metadata. All right. Let's say we have a table, and we'll, we'll build on some of the tables that we went over. Um, in class uh, last time. The question was is, is metadata redundant? And no, it, it isn't really, but let's illustrate why it isn't. Let's say we had a class table, all right? They had a list of all the courses here at LC. So we have a course table, and maybe the primary key is the course ID which would be something like CISS 143 or whatever. And I'll put an asterisk to indicate that's a primary key. There might be a department that offers it. Maybe there's a department ID that's a foreign key. Uh, there may be the number of credit hours. There could be the name of the course. There could be an extended course description, and so on down the line. What metadata would be something like this. The data stored would look like this. How, you know, maybe we have CISS 143, that's part of the business division, uh, is three credit hours, the name is database design. And the extended course description would be whatever. CISS 216, business division, three credit hours, web development. So that's the data. This doesn't have any redundant data in it because each course is only in there once. And the number of credit hours for the course is only in there once. What metadata it would be would be something like this. This is a seven character field. It must be unique because it's the primary key. And no nulls are permitted. So we can't have an empty field for that. That's metadata. That's data about the data. That's describing what this field is and what you can put into it. That, that is stored, that is stored in the, as part of the data the database and it's set up via the DBMS, correct. And then everything about the course ID, department ID, 
Exactly. That the, the, all this stuff would be the data that lives in the table. And this is when the table is defined. Yeah, another way maybe to say metadata is uh, the table definition data. Uh, we'll look in access in a minute, uh, or in a few minutes here. We'll, go, we'll create some of these tables, and we'll see what the metadata is. But anything that sort of describes the data is a primary key. You can't put nulls in it. It's seven characters long. All that stuff is what we mean by metadata. And that's actually stored in the database. In addition, that this department ID connects to a department table, that's another piece of metadata as well to define that there's a relationship between those two things. You had your hand up a second ago? I was just going to mention that the, when you go and you, give, you, know, you tell what enough to field. Exactly. Uh, that's also the metadata. Exactly, yeah. So you're not putting in the values of the, the metadata isn't the values. The metadata is sort of a, a, a description of exactly what's okay to put in that field and, and other information about that. All right. Great question. I do appreciate, by the way, anytime I'm in the middle of a, uh, a, a, a lecture or I'm talking about something, if, if something doesn't sound right or something's confusing, just flag me down, you know, just, just slow me down, put the brakes on me, all right, and I'll be glad to answer your question. All right, but yes, the DBMS would be used to set up the database and the metadata. So, I guess what I'm saying is, even when we trim out all the redundant data in here, when we add the metadata in the here, and we, count when, and we consider how much space the DBMS takes up, it's not like you're saving disk space. All right. So, although what, you know, when you talk about the eliminating of redundant data, it may seem like okay, there's going to be less data. The metadata and the fact that the DBMS is a big program sort of compensates for it or overcompensates for it. All right. Let's consider. Uh, again, let's see where I am in my notes. Let's define some terms. And let, let's, let's define uh, some of the terms that we alluded to last time but maybe didn't uh, uh, define very precisely. All right. First of all, the term database. All right. Been talking about database for two hours now and haven't defined database. And I'm sure there's a great definition in the book. All right. If I were going to define a, a database, I would say a database is a collection of data about multiple entities and the relationships between those entities. Okay? So. It's not like a spreadsheet where you have one giant table that has everything in it. We're storing different entities. We talked last time how there might be a course entity and a section entity. All right. Instead of having one giant table that mixes up courses and sections and that information. That's what leads to redundancy. So we have a collection of entities. And those entities are related and the relationships are stored. And the relationships are made explicit. They're not implied. All right? In other words, sometimes in, in old school programming, you'd have two files and you'd know that the second column in this file matches up with the third column in that file or something like that. It was sort of an implied relationship. But it wasn't stored and it wasn't enforced. With databases, the relationships are stored and they can be enforced. All right? So that's how I would define a database. A table represents a collection of data about one entity. All right? I probably should rewind a second and define the word entity. All right? An entity, a good way, a good simple way to think of an entity is an entity is a person, place, or thing. All right. Keeping in mind that again there are some exceptions, you know, almost everything I say, you know, there's exceptions to. And also keep in mind that the thing might not be like a tangible thing that you can put your hand on, like an order, you know. An order really isn't a thing like 
you know, I guess, not in the same way that a classroom is a thing, that I can point to this classroom or a professor's a thing or something like that. But it can be sort of like a conceptual thing. Even like something like course, you know. A, you know, what is a course? Is that a thing I can hold my hand? Well, not really, but it's a conceptual sort of thing. A good way to identify entities is a, in a problem is if someone's telling you about something, look for the nouns. All right? This isn't an English class, all right, but look for the nouns. So, for example, if I was setting up a uh, database for a car repair shop, and I was talking to uh, the owner of the shop, and the owner of the shop was explaining it to me, and the owner of the shop might say, you know, we have, um, you know, we have uh, several different mechanics, and we get appointments, and our customers call to make an appointment, and then uh, a mechanic is assigned to it. And in addition to a mechanic, maybe the, what would you say, garage or thing that goes up and down. Uh, a, a real person that owned a, uh, a car body shop would know what that thing is called that goes up and down. But you get the idea. Those things, chances are, are going to be the entities. You're going to have a mechanics table. You're going to have a little bay of your garage table. You're going to have a customer table. You're going to have an appointment table, and so on and so forth. So at least as far as your first pass goes, uh, a good way in identifying the entities is to look for the nouns when someone describes the activity. All right. The thing is, is that a table should only have stuff about one entity. If it doesn't, if you mix up entities in a table, if you have one table that is really two entities sort of disguised, that's when you go into redundant data. If you remember last time when I put up uh, on here a thing that said something like this. I had the course ID. Uh, credit hours, the course name, um, the section number, the days met, the times met, that's really two entities mixed together. All right. How do I know that? Because if I carry this through, I'm going to have some redundant data. So for example, if I put in CISS 143, still three credit hours. The name of it is database design and implementation. For section two, that meets Tuesday and Thursday, 2 to 4 p.m. There's redundant data there. So if I made this my table, all right, I'd really have disguised in one table two entities. And the way I can tell that is because I have redundant data. All right? The credit hours. Hey, you don't get different credit hours if you take section one or section two. You get the credit hours if you take this class. You get the same number of credit hours. And therefore, this is really two entities sort of disguised as one. There's a section entity and there is a class entity. All right? If we're going to break this down in the tables where each entity uh, or, or yeah, each table only contains one entity, then I'd have a course table whose primary key was a course ID, number of credit hours, the name, and then I'd have a section table that may be said course ID three section one date Monday and Wednesday time 10 to 12 this one CISS 143 section 2 Tuesday and Thursday 2 to 4 so that would be how I would break that table that's really two entities disguised as one into two separate tables. So that's a table, a table of data, rows and columns. 
Each row contains all of the columns associated for one member of that entity. All right. Think of each row as being a member of the entity. There is the one class, then I could have the next class, the next class, the next class. Here's the next section, the next section, the next section, and so on. It's all the pieces of data, all the columns about that. Another name for columns uh, is attribute. Another name for a column is an attribute. So I could say that I have all the attributes about an entity, or I could say I have all the columns for the entity. That's about the same thing. All right. Uh, sort of an older term that isn't a hundred percent correct, but but sometimes serves a purpose is field. I'll say that that's a field in that table. Just like I might call a row a record. Record. That's sort of an older sort of terminology. Row is probably the more appropriate term with relational databases, but it means about the same thing. A row or a record is every uh, piece of data, every column, every attribute about one member of the entity. Primary key. Primary key is a column or group of columns that uniquely identifies a member of the entity that uniquely identifies a row. By uniquely identify, it means that no two have the same value. So whatever is the primary key for a table, there can't be two rows with the same value. What's more, the values can never be null. A null is sort of a, 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 a not, you know, no entry for a particular field. Good example of that might be my web class, CISS 143, section www1. There's no date and time associated with it, right? So there would be null fields in there. You know, think of them as being empty, all right? Now, Primary key for the course table would be the course ID. Yes? Um, when you have no data or no value, isn't that considered bad data? Not necessarily. It, it could just be, uh, it, it could be that, that that particular entity doesn't have a value for that attribute. Um, if that happens repeatedly, if, there, if you have groups of fields for which there are often null values, we'll study a special, specialized case of that called uh, an entity subtype later on. But I wouldn't make the blanket statement to say that uh, a null indicates a problem. All right? Because again, in this case, the day and time, there truly is no day and time associated with an internet class. All right, there's no room associated with an internet class, for example. That, that's not a problem per se. Um, we will talk about examples where uh, with an entity subtype, if you notice that a whole block of fields could be null in many cases, then, then that is a problem. But by itself, not necessarily a problem. Yes? So putting NA isn't better or worse than getting a blank? Well, putting NA is deceptive. All right. Um, because, you know, uh, how, how do I want to say this? It truly doesn't have a day. It doesn't have a room. So therefore, the most direct way to indicate that is by simply not putting anything in for that. Um, let me give you an example. Um, let's say if we had room ID in there instead of uh, date and time. An internet section of the class, again, has no room associated with it. If we put NA in there, then at a glance it would look like those classes existed in room NA. All right? And if you were doing a scheduling chart, you'd have to put in your code, oh, disregard when uh, sections have NA as their room associated with them. Those sort of catches um, are the things that often go wrong, all right? And, and, and are the things uh, that um, you're, you're using a piece of data to signal something as opposed to mean what it's supposed to. Uh, 
We did that all the time in, in systems that I, that I first developed, and that's a problem. For example, customer 999 isn't really a customer, but it's such and such. That leads to real problems as far as reporting and querying and programming, because you always have these little catches in the code and all that. And therefore, it's best to just, in your database, tell it like it is. If there is no room, have a null for the room. That means that there's no entry for it. So yes. All right. So the primary key to course table would be the course ID, because truly, there's no two courses here on campus that have the same course ID. If you say CISS 143, you're talking about this course. If you say CISS 216, you're talking about the web development course and so on. All right. What do you suppose would be the primary key in the section table? Section. Well, not necessarily because there could be for CISS 216 a section one, CISS 216 a web section. Well, that also, there could be three sections for CISS 143. It's a combination, yeah. It's a combination of both of them. So a primary key can be multiple parts. But I thought in Access before, uh, I played around and then you can only have one primary key. Uh, you can set two fields as a primary key. Yeah, we'll, we'll see an example. Uh, we'll see an example of that. It's tricky because if you use, if you don't go about it the right way, when you select one field as a primary key, it unselects the other one. So there's a little bit of a trick to get it to work, but yeah, you can have multiple part key. All right. So in this case, this would be the primary key of this table. These two taken together would be the primary key to that table. And that's okay to have a two-part primary key or a three-part or whatever. Another way to use primary keys is to use what's called an auto number field or an auto increment field. And all that is is simply a sequential number. The first row gets a value of 1, the second row that you put in gets a value of 2 and 3 and 4 and so on. Um, now, if, you, if you do that, uh -huh. when you say you have two primary keys, right. you put in CISS 143, can you put an auto value for the second one? And it'll... No. I, no, I don't believe so. If you did, it would go all the way through. Okay. All right. What you do with an auto number key, and we'll look at an example of this uh, going forward, is, again, when you use an auto number key, typically that's the whole key. That's known sometimes as a surrogate key, because that doesn't mean anything. Right? In other words, if, if I used sort of a course auto number, whatever the first course would, uh, entered would, hap would be number one. CISS 143. Course number two would be CISS 216, and so on. And that would be the primary key. That one, two doesn't really mean anything except inside the database. No one would call it course one or course two. That's known as a surrogate key. All right? This is known as a natural key. Because in conversation, people would say, I'm enrolled in CISS 216. That means something outside the database. You know, whereas surrogate keys are just keys that are identified just to make it unique. We'll see examples of both of these. The first example we're going to give, we're going to use a natural key. We're going to, we're going to do it as, we, as, we, as we've done it here. But in uh, future examples, we'll use a surrogate key. And we might even do some of the examples both ways, you know, just to see the difference. All right. So largely, the, 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 the decision of the person designing the database, which way to go. The next definition that I have is for a foreign key. All right. A foreign key is where a field in one table refers to the primary key in another table. Or you could say points to, references, however you want to say it. So, course ID is both a primary key and, or part of the primary key in this table, and it's also a foreign key over to course ID in this table. This is where we can define referential integrity. 
Referential integrity means I can't put a section in that doesn't match up with a valid course. Which makes sense, right? I mean, a section, a class, has to belong to a valid course on campus. It can't be a, a section of some made up course. It uh, has to be a valid course. Another example of a foreign key is if we had a professor ID in this table that pointed to the different professors here on campus. Because that would point to the professor ID. So we get around having redundant data by being able to have foreign keys that point to the data. So for example, if you want to know how many credit hours this section is, you use the course ID to look up the course in the course table and say that's three credit hours. If you want to know who the professor for this class is, you use the professor ID to point and find out the professor's name is Zellers and his office is BU211J and his phone is whatever my phone number is. All right, uh, extension 4796. See, I do know my phone number. I was afraid I didn't. And the, the excuse I always give is I never call myself, all right, which is true, but I probably do need it to, to give the other folks. All right. Let's go and build this, and, and as we're building this, we'll see the metadata, all right, and we'll, we'll see a first-hand example of defining keys and foreign keys and referential integrity. So let's go into Access, all right. We don't have Office 2010 in here, interestingly enough. That's okay. We'll use, or am I just missing it? Pardon me? Yeah. Yeah, I'll, I'll use that one. I was just looking to see if 2010 was on here and I was just missing it. Uh huh. Uh huh. If you have if you have 2007, that's good enough. That's fine. Yeah, I'm not not going to quibble over that. Uh, you might have to reconcile a little bit if the screens look a little different, but it shouldn't be that huge of a deal. Do keep in mind, and I've had a number of people ask me like why we use Access in this course, because Access isn't the most robust database. All right, it's meant for personal use for one or two people just to throw together a quick database uh, and so on. The reason we do is, again, a lot of people have it because they have Office, all right? And if you learned Office, you kind of have a heads up on learning access, all right? And the other thing is, is keep in mind the important things in this class really are, are the concepts. And database design, all right, um, sort of transcends platform. In other words, a well-designed database in Access will be a well-designed database in SQL Server or Oracle or whatever. Uh, but we need to practice on something. So we might as well practice on the thing that's most readily available, that's going to be simple, straightforward to learn, and so on. All right. So let's go in. And I'm going to create a new database. I said I'm going to create a new database. I will put it on the desktop and we'll call it school. Now, when you first create a database, it says, well look, there has to be at least one table in this database, right? So it gives you a table for free, <laughs> all right? And it doesn't know what you're doing this for, so it calls it table one. Keep in mind that access is meant for people who aren't necessarily experts in database design. So a lot of the things that access does is meant for people that really maybe have not had a class in database design or whatever, and they want to make it real easy. We don't want to take the easy route. We want to make sure that we understand everything about database design. So therefore, what we're going to do, instead of entering in data this way, we're going to right mouse on the table and say go to design view. 
All right, that's how you should create all the tables you're creating. When you create a new table, right mouse on it, go in the design view. It will ask you for the name of the table and I'll type in course for the name. All right. It knows that you have to have a primary key and it's suggesting for you to use an auto number key but you don't have to. So for example, in this case I'm going to say course ID and it's not going to be an auto number. I'm going to say it is a text field. A text field is one in which you can put letters and numbers. All right. Down here is the metadata. How big is it? Well, course numbers here are seven characters. Is it required? Yes. Allow zero length? No. All right, and so on down the line. You can also put a little bit of description in here, you know. Um, primary key, example, CISS 216, or whatever. You can put notes in there that will help someone later on sort of understand what, what you're doing with it. The little key next to it indicates that it's the primary key. All right. I'll go in and put in some other things. Credit hours. That's not a text field. It's a number. I can specify what kind of number it's going to be. You can see the description. An integer I think is a value 0 through either 255 or 0 through 65,000 and change. I don't remember. It's one or two bytes worth of data. All right. Um, you could put other things. Is it required? Yes. Of course, has to have a number of credit hours. Um, let's see, what's the third thing? Name. Give me a warning when I typed in name. If you read this, the, the, the name or the, the word name has a special meaning to access. And therefore, it's prone to confusion. So it's suggesting that you don't call this column name. All right. So, hey, I'm not going to tempt fate, so I'm going to call it course name or curse name, course name. And it's text 255. That's, that's fine. Some of them might have long descriptions. So that's enough for this table. What I'm doing here is I'm defining the table. I'm defining the different columns that are going to be filled in. One common mistake that some students would do is mix up the columns with the values for the columns. For example, what some students would, might think of doing is making a column named CISS216 and another one called CISS. Those aren't columns. Those are values for the course ID column. All right. I'm going to save this table. And now, if I need to go and change the structure of the table again, or the, the definition of it, I can go back into design view. Or if I just double click it, I'm in a data sheet view that allows me to enter values in for that. All right. So I could type in CISS 143, three credit hours, database, design, and implementation. CISS 216, three credit hours, web development. Now, because we've defined that as the primary key, I can't go in and put in a different course that has the value of CISS 143 or CISS 216. All right. It's okay with it now because I haven't tried to save it. What tries to save it? When I go try to go to another row. So if I click down here into that row, my phone rings. All right, amazingly enough. But it tells me I must enter a value in course credit hours. Okay, I do that. Ah, 
It tells me I can't do it because of duplicated values in the course ID field. All right. Why are there duplicated values? Because there's two CISS 143s. I can't do that. And it won't let me save it until I go in and say, oh, I meant that to be CISS 243. The other thing I can't do is go in and insert a row without a course ID. Remember, because every column has to have a value in the primary key. So, primary key, every row has to have one, has to be unique. All right? If you think about it, we're using that primary key to point to values in that table. Therefore, it has to be unique because we can't be able to point to two different values. All right? We can't be able to point to two different rows. All right? Questions about this one? Let's go in and create the second table, the section table. All right? I can save that. How do I create a second table? I go in and say create table. All right? Again, it gives me table one. I can right mouse on it, go into design view, and I can put in section. And I can make the two-part key. So I'll say course ID is a text field. Seven characters is required. Do not allow zero length, and so on. Then I can do section number, and we'll assume that it's a character, because I think there's www's in some of the section numbers. I don't know. We'll just assume that there is. And we can say days of week. And that can just be a text field, and we can have times, and have that a text field. Now, as far as making two columns the primary key, the way you do that, again, if I go and try to set section number as a primary key and click on a little key, it turns off the course ID and makes the section ID the primary key. The way to make both of them is I have to go and highlight both of them that way. And then I press the little key, and now both of them are primary keys. All right, so now we have that with a two-part key. And I can go and save this. Now, course table has a course ID, section table has a course ID, but those two aren't related yet. Even though they're the same name, it may be obvious to you that, hey, those are related, you have to actually define that relationship. All right? And the way in Access that you define it is by going into Database Tools. You go into Database Tools, and you click on Relationships. It will show you the tables that you've defined in your database. In our case, we have two tables. All right. I can select them both. And I can click Add. It shows me both those tables side by side. Now, to create the relationship, I can drag the course ID to course ID. And it will say, the course ID in the course table matches up with the course ID in the section table. Now, here's what's important. Enforce referential integrity. I'm going to click yes for that. 
That's what really creates the relationship between them. What is an avoid default check? I don't know. Yeah. The question was, is why, why is it not by default checked? I don't know. Uh, if I was creating a real database to really use, I would never leave that unchecked. The only time I've ever le left that unchecked is when I'm converting data. And I'm bringing data in from some other source, and the data might not be good from the other source. So I have to go do a little data scrubbing. And at first, the relationship might not be correct. Then I'll go and I'll set that. But otherwise, for any new database you create, that should be checked. Without it, you're really not getting the advantages of using a relational database. All right? You're using a database to sort of just store regular old files. All right? Now watch what happens. If I go into the section table, I can go in and enter CISS 143, section 1, meets Mondays and Wednesdays, 10 to 12. If I try to enter in something for a bogus section, CISS 999, Boom, I get an error. And what that error says, I cannot add or change a record because a related record is required in the table course. So I have to have something in course to match up with that, to match up with that course ID. And I don't. All right. Therefore, it won't let me enter that in. And that's a good thing, right? Because no matter by hook or crook, you can't get in some bad data. Yes? Okay, let's go back. How, the question was, how do I define which one's the primary? Checking that box, maybe get that error. Yes, checking the box, maybe get the error. The fact that the course ID is a primary key in this table indicates that that's the one that's being looked up. It's also a primary key. But it's only part of the primary key in this one. Okay. All right, so. so if you were, it doesn't matter which way you drag it. doesn't matter which way you drag it. It, it knows that sort of the, the main guy in that relationship is the one, is the table in which you have the primary key. All right. Okay. Couple of things, and we'll go over these in more detail uh, next time. Next time, I definitely want to talk about surrogate keys. I also want to talk a little bit more about referential integrity, specifically when you can't enter in, when you can't create that relationship. One thing to remember is you need the tables op uh, closed rather to create that relationship. So let's delete that relationship. If I am looking at the course table, if I have the course table open, I cannot create that relationship. All right. The idea is, is creating relationships a big deal. If you're doing something like that, you shouldn't be in the middle of changing values in the table or changing the structure of the table. So if the table's open, you can't make a relationship with it. The other thing, other reason that you could not make a relationship is if these things were of different types. For example, if one was a number and the other was text, then it doesn't quite know how to match them up and it will give you an error. The last thing that you could have is if you already have bogus data in your table. For example, if I had something that was bogus in my section table, I couldn't create the relationship because it knows that there's bogus data in there. There's already data that doesn't match up, therefore I can't create the relationship. Yes? Correct. Right. Correct. Sure. Those, even that 
I could match course ID to course ID if bo in both tables they were the same type. Okay. If section number was something else, it doesn't matter. All right. If section number, for example, was a number, was an integer, that would be okay. It's the two fields that you're creating the relationship between that have to have the same type. So of course, oh, go ahead. Same data type, not actually, or it has to have both the same data type and the same. No, the fourth key can be any field that you want it to be. Correct. Right. In other words, the fact that this has a two-part key and that has a one doesn't, doesn't matter. Right. We'll explore more of these in, in subsequent weeks. What I want to do next time definitely is talk about surrogate keys and talk a little bit more about the uh, relationships. Are there any questions? Go ahead. Yes. The definition of a foreign key is because it points to the primary key of another field. It, it's used to match up. Can you point to the non-primary Can you point to credits? No. Wouldn't you, you know, no, it wouldn't, it wouldn't let you, even if it's the same data type or whatever. The reason is, is, is keep in mind the way this is working. The way this is working is that this section has to know what course it belongs to. All right. How do you point to a course? What identifies a course? The primary key identifies it. Credit hours doesn't identify it. There's a lot of courses that could have three credit hours or four credit hours or whatever. What identifies a course is the course ID. And therefore that's what any table that wants to point to a course has to use. Look at it this way. What's probably the primary key in the database for the student table? Your student ID. That's why on any form that you get, <laughs> all right, your schedule, your bill, whatever, it's going to probably show you your student ID. Why? It couldn't use your name, for example, because then two people that coincidentally had the same name could get the same bill. You have to point and say, no, this bill is for this person. And the only way you can guarantee that you're pointing to one distinct person is if you use the primary key to that table, that is, the, the, in, the, in this case, the student ID. Same thing with the course ID. You'd have to point to the primary key in that table as well. All right. We'll explore these more. I know some of these are difficult concepts. You will get a sense of it by working through the assignments, but um, again, uh, we'll talk about these more next time. Database design is important. All right. One thing that I, I was just talking uh, uh, with another faculty member about this class. One thing that's tough about this class is we probably cover some of the hardest stuff in this class right off the bat. All right, <laughs> which is unfortunate. The concepts and the theory behind it, the abstract sort of concepts and notions behind it, really, in my mind, is probably the toughest thing in this class. And you have to know any of that before you do anything else. So therefore, in a way, we do the toughest things in this class. So we'll practice this a lot. We'll talk about it. We'll have activities. And, and you'll get a lot of work on this by the, by the end of the semester. All right. We'll see you over in lab.